This is Rhett Reed Podcast. We take a deep dive into the Fear Street series. And review other books we've read. I'm Serge. And I'm Anna. We're happy you can join us. Happy and excited to be interviewing Edgar Quintero, author of the New York Times bestselling novel Meddling Kids. He has also written two other novels, his first published in English, Supernatural Enhancements, and his most recent work, This Body's Not Big Enough for Both of Us. Although currently a resident of New York City, Edgar is originally from Barcelona and has published two earlier novels in Catalan. We welcome author Edgar Quintero to the podcast. Hi, Edgar. Hi, Edgar. Hello. Thank you for joining us. It's a Thank pleasure. Thank you for having me. So before we get into the books, which we're very eager to discuss, we always like to know a little bit more about the author, in this case, Edgar Quintero, the author, and what your writing style is like and how it comes about. We did a little bit of research coming into this interview, and we read somewhere that you're a big fan of pulpy paperbacks, maybe found in a bargain bin or something. Yes, that kind of thing, yeah. So we're a Fear Street podcast, and we're wondering if you've ever happened to read any Arl Stein books growing up. Arl Stein, yes, yes. He was, for a time, he was really popular in Spain. Not as much as he was in America, but yeah, several dozens of his books were published. Yeah. Okay. Is this more like the Goosebumps series, or is it other stuff as well? Is there any other series? Yeah. I'm not saying they weren't published in Spain, but maybe I was a little too older for them. Yeah, the Goosebumps series. I remember having read at least the first 10 in the order that were published in Spain. Probably it's different from this one. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with his work. Okay, yeah. cool. Obviously, you were reading a lot of different books growing up. We heard about you were reading The Famous Five. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, as a kid, as a very young kid. <laughs> yeah. You just mentioned Goosebumps. I'm sure a lot of other books. What got you into coming over to the other side of fiction and actually starting to write? I don't think it was books, or books were not solely responsible. It's not like I started writing books naturally. I just remember that as a kid, I was writing down a lot of ideas, stuff I wanted to do at some point when I grew up scripts, animated shows, and uh, video games. Lots of ideas. Then there was a point where I decided, maybe, I don't know, my late teens, that writing was actually the easiest way to put those ideas out, to show them to somebody, to share them. And that's what got me into writing. Was there any genre that you leaned towards when you were starting out? Not really. I was trying to be quite serious, actually, because I had this idea, this preconceived idea back then, Catalan literary scene is a little responsible for that, that books were a much more highbrow form of entertainment than movies and animated shows, that I could not do the same things, I could not work with genre fiction, that it was supposed to be serious in a way. So when I started, it was pretty much like that, really serious, really moody teenager (laughs) stuff. It was uh, much later when I realized that I could start doing the kind of thing I enjoy doing, and even later when I noticed I could do the kind of thing that I enjoy watching or playing or reading. I just want to jump back a little bit or maybe jump ahead. Driving into the city, I'm always taken by just the beautiful skyline. You get a really great view pretty much any way you come in. And we drove in today and the thought crossed my mind. What a beautiful city, greatest city on earth. I always think that seeing New York. And then I started thinking about our conversation with you that we we're about to have. And I realized it seems like most of your if not all published books so far that are out, were written really before you came to New York City. And I'm wondering if coming to New York City is changing anything about your writing. And maybe in the future, we're going to see... An influence from living in the city or just being in the city. I don't know. I think through this, I had already been in the city at least once, even when my first book in Catalan was published. That was Dormia on Winona Ryder, Sleeping with Winona Ryder in translation. That one even had several chapters that took place in New York. And at the time, I was even doing research and stuff, or maybe I just wanted to visit New York. (laughs) And I stayed here for a week. It was my first time. That was in 2006, I think. And I think since then, what has appeared in all of my books is this view of the U.S. as a foreigner, as a very starstruck foreigner, actually. Mm. I've always said that I'm always impressed by uh, the city, pretty much by the country itself. My view is somewhat different. I like it because it's, you know, for the first 25 years of my life, this aesthetic is something that I had only seen on screen. 
and living here now feels like being in a movie. I like this country because it doesn't look real to me, essentially. I think it is a work of fiction. I kind of like, I wish that it was governed by, like, by the laws of fiction, too. That's really interesting. I want to steer a little bit more into the nitty gritty of the writing. As a non-writer, these are the silly questions that I wonder about when I wonder about authors okay. sitting in their high tower, you know, <laughs> pondering, you know, the finer things that I will never comprehend. So, first the high of all, tower is a room in Brooklyn, <laughs> just so you know, but whatever. <laughs> preferred method of writing computer or typewriter or handwriting in a notebook uh and i i type on my computer there was a time where i took uh handwritten notes and i usually uh, i never moved on to the computer until i had like a page or something of handwritten notes but uh, i stopped doing that since i moved since i switched to laptops and okay. i can carry them around do you have a set writing schedule or do you have daily writing goals no no i have no quotas absolutely nothing like that I have like a few personal rules, not rules, more like peeves. I always write in order. I don't like to say that I do drafts. Everything I write is usually just like a finished version, something that I would feel comfortable turning in, even at the the very first stages. I am very strict with that. I never write a paragraph and think, okay, this needs a few jokes, but I'll add them later. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, okay, here we need the description. I'll come back to it. No, that never happens. I always move in the same order, you know, in the right order and make sure that everything is finished as I go. I don't have to look back. Of course, I do look back and I edit a lot, but I make sure that the first version is something that I'm not ashamed of. So with your non-draft approach, do you have an outline for how the book is going to go? Uh, Yeah, that's another thing. I am a terrible planner, and I pretty much make up stuff as I go. Obviously, there are ideas. I mean, I envision things. I usually, for a novel, for instance, I usually start with main characters that are well-defined in my head. Then I move on to stuff that could explode at the end. And then I think of everything in the middle. That's my usual process. But uh, again, I write it in order, and it's not like I I see that far ahead. I just make it up as I go. Going along with that, things blow up at the end, main characters. One thing I noticed is there's usually a big reveal. Is it something that you want your readers to be surprised by? Or is it something that you leave a few well-placed clues here and there, and the really astute reader should be able to kind of pick up on it. You have to leave some clues, I think, that's necessary. But uh, on the other hand, I tend to think that Deus Ex Machina is just Latin for I didn't see that coming. It doesn't mean that it wasn't there to begin with. So, yeah, I want people to be surprised, but it's very difficult to judge whether it will surprise people and whether they will think, oh yeah, I should have seen this coming, or they will reject it. That's a very difficult thing to do, and I have a, I don't claim to know how uh, readers will react to my stuff, because I, I can tell you that half the time I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so I guess what you're saying is that you don't come up with pages of backstory for each character before you sit down to write the book? Oh, no, no, absolutely not. Also, I believe that everything necessary to understand the book should be in the books. There's no need to think of background or maps or anything like that if you're not going to put it in there at all. So when you're in your writing state and suddenly different story ideas sort of come in while you're writing a story, how do you know when that specific idea will fit well with the story you're in or like if you're going to reserve that for maybe another story? I don't know. I do keep a list of ideas. I'm not saying written, actually. I do have a a list of of stuff that I think I can develop, and sometimes when I get stuck, I look on the list and see if there's a trick there that I I could pull from under my head now. But but again, no, you try to do it as as brief as possible. I like brevity too, so you just try to connect the dots you have in the most uh, straightforward way possible. How does being multilingual influence how you write? Do you write and think in the same language, or how is writing in Catalan different than writing in English? It's extremely different. I try to think in English when I'm writing in English, but uh, uh, being multilingual essentially only means that at any given time you know the word for what you want to say in any language except the one you are speaking right now. (laughs) It has helped me in, I think writing in my third language gives me the advantage that I feel less constrained than a a native speaker because I don't have this immediate intuition about what what sounds wrong. To me, any six words in English that are grammatically correct sound amazing, no matter who says them or in what context. That sounds even like exotic to me. Again, that sounds like fiction language. 
I often say that I, I don't even write in English. I write in Hollywoodese. I write in the language that I feel that, I don't know, Bruce Willis saying this would sound all right. Yeah, that's pretty much it. People talk about the flexibility of the English language, which is true. I mean, compared to, to Spanish and Catalan, I think that the grammatical rules are more flexible. But also, because I don't know what's wrong, I tend to bend those rules probably beyond their pain threshold. You did mention at one time that it would be difficult to write a car chase scene in Catalan. Is that... Yeah, no, it is, because I've, I've, I've done that, yeah. And yeah, that's a good example. Much of the stuff that I want to write essentially was created in English first. Like, my first book in English was The Supernatural Enhancements, was about a haunted house, gothic horror. The truth is that writing that in English instead of Catalan was actually easier to me because everything I had read in the genre was in English. Translating all that stuff, it seems like I'm talking about specific words like, I don't know, architectural terms or something like that, but no, I'm talking about the mood. The words for that aesthetic, the words that come to mind are essentially in English. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying there are not equivalences in Catalan, but any translation is worse than the original. Mm. Is there any chance that any of your books that are in Catalan would be translated to English? Not really. Mostly because the first one I've already grown disaffected with, like I did long ago. I don't think it's good enough anymore. And the second one, I seem to recall it was better. But um, I don't think it would fare well with American audiences. It was a very local thing that Catalan people, I hoped, would find funny. It's not like they did. But uh, I don't think that it would do well here. It's about, you know, very local kind of humor and very local references. It got an award, right? No, the first one, the real one and Rider, got me two awards I see. and considerable money, but not a readership, actually. I see. And then Vibe, which was the second pretty much lost me the awards and still didn't get me the readership. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I decided to switch to English. <laughs> I see. I think we have one final question sure. regarding your writing. That question is, do you have a writing kryptonite? Something where you just can't get through a section of writing. You need to like find the scotch and start drinking in order to like, get yourself through it. No, I'd say no. I don't remember writing myself into a corner. There are things I avoid because I know I, I can't write them. I'm not going to like them when they're written. A good example is uh, sex scenes. I don't do that at all because I suck at it. But no, I don't remember ever having, having had to like, you know, delete two pages because I just didn't know how to move forward. I guess I know my weaknesses already. So no kryptonite there. Focusing more on the books you've written, so each of your books seem to fit specific subgenres. So you have noir, you have gothic horror, and you have Scooby Doo. Um, yeah. Did you do like a lot of binge watching or like reading of that specific genre while you were writing or before you were writing to get yourself into that zone? No, but I sometimes do binge read or binge watch, and that's what gives me the idea. Makes me think, wow, I wish I could write something like this. I remember that happened with the supernatural enhancements. I had been reading like a lot of gothic and ghost stories, M.R. James kind of stuff. And then I, I've always been a, a Lovecraft fan. Lovecraft and Friends, that circle of, of geeks writing horror, cosmic horror stories. And yeah, I guess that's what piled up to writing both the supernatural enhancements and meddling kids, which is, I want to try this. Once I am writing it, no, I don't think I read that genre again, you know, for help or for consulting. When I need help in writing, like how would some other author do this scene specifically, I usually don't go in the same genre. Like I have a few go-to authors for that. I check them out and then usually I see how they wrote their way out of it. Okay. Do you listen to music at all when you write? To no. The usually in silence okay well how about yeah, i guess we're still talking about writing style <laughs> no no problem <laughs> the um you have what i would call a unique brand of humor we really appreciate it but sometimes in the book you have an intensely emotional moment that is occurring how do you balance the humor with intense scenes like that i don't the humor is something i know that i cannot remove from my books before I said that I have trouble controlling my uh, readers' reactions, that's because I really don't know how to convey some feelings in writing. Like, I've written two horror books, and I swear I'm writing scare scenes, and I still don't know if it's scary or not. Mm. I have no idea. I am guessing, you know, I'm writing what I think feels is what probably, I don't know, Wes Craven would be writing, and I'm like, yeah, I guess this is scary enough, but I'm not sure ever. 
The only thing I'm sure about actually is jokes. The only thing I kind of understand the inner workings is humor. So that part, I never remove it from my books. I know it's always going to be there. And it's there during the trivial moments and during the very dramatic moments. I think one of the things I am grateful, actually, uh, since I've been working in English, is having found an editor who never says, this is no time for a joke here, which used to happen before. And I feel free there, I think, you know, somehow I've built this brand, which is like being extremely goofy, even at the moments with the, where the stakes are higher. Yeah, I think to us, the readers, it seems like this genius way which you're walking this line and and it's working for us but what you're saying is that's just how you are you want to keep that humor there because that's that's what you understand that's what i know like yeah that so you're saying it just comes naturally to you jokes is what i know i can do yeah it's essentially that you can have a very serious uh conversation in the romantic plot you know andy and carrie finally talking it out and truly like i want to do well really i don't know if i'm doing it well at all like, I don't know if I'm sounding stupid or not. It's, it's impossible for me to, you know, to read myself objectively and say, this is trash or, or this is genius. I don't know. But I kind of, I have deluded myself into thinking that when I write a joke, that is genius. <laughs> <laughs> so I go for the joke always because I feel comfortable there. That's what I know will cause a good impression. It works for me. I just finished Supernatural Enhancements like yesterday uh-huh. in preparation for the interview. And that, I was definitely laughing out loud. Yeah, and Supernatural Enhancement is actually pretty much the serious of the three. But there's still humorous moments even in the most intense scenes. Again, yeah, because that's what I feel most comfortable writing. Mm-hmm. I've listened to Malinkid and his body is not big enough. And what I thought really helped mesh the styles was like the screenplay, the almost like the screenplay format that the books have. Where did that come from? You don't really see that in fiction. You mean that the... Like, you know, like the flies buzzing around and the birds are outside. Oh, that kind of visual uh, Yeah, it's stuff. like very visual and very fourth wall breaking. And it's it's almost as if you're setting it up for a movie to just happen and you can just see it so vividly and a lot of the humor just comes from that i guess i've seen people doing that in writing but uh but yeah again like in english and writing genre fiction i am comfortable acknowledging that my influences are not just books i've always wanted to write the kind of story that an action movie or a tv show or a or a point and click graphic adventure gives me and uh, finally, here in this language and in this country, I found a way to do that in books. I have no trouble imitating them. I'm not ashamed of using the same kind of, you know, cutaway gags or uh, that kind of stuff. I think it's just uh, another resource. Yeah, I think also the way you write dialogue sometimes. I think I first noticed it in Meddling Kids. That was the first of your books that I read. I listened on audiobook. I guess in an audiobook, maybe it even stands out a little bit more. The way the dialogue is written, where it, I guess give the person's name. Yeah, you change it to script format. You yeah, just exactly. say the speaker name and yeah. then the speech. But that really worked, and then we were surprised that it worked. Yeah, however, that's not as much just a movie influence. Obviously, it is. Like, uh, I've done screenwriting, so that's where I learned it. But um, it's a resource that I was already using in... I think it, I started in Vaibi, which was my second novel in Catalan. It's simply a way to make dialogue flow faster. I think that when it's more than two characters speaking, you have to add all the text, like he said, she said, and of course, I I never settle with said. I have to go with he asked and she retorted and he chuckled and she moaned, that kind of thing. You know, it gets tiring. If you want to do like very rapid fire kind of dialogue, you know, the kind of Aaron Sorkin thing, writing it in script form helps. It makes things flow much easier. People can, like, you know, just see the characters talking in their heads with their own voices. You don't, you don't need the narrator for that. So I omit him. Cool. I think we're going into specific books now. So we're going to start with This Body is Not Big Enough for Both of Us. Okay. Yeah, your latest novel, which we just read this summer. Both enjoyed it very much. So first of all, what made you want to write a detective story? How did this story come about? This one started because I haven't read that much noir, unlike gothic horror and Lovecraftian horror. This one started because back in Barcelona, I was working for a a Spanish satirical magazine, El Jueves. It's pretty much similar to your mad magazine, probably more political. And um, for a time, I was writing these pieces of flash fiction for them. And uh, they had to be within a genre. So I thought, because genre has the advantage that 
with a few well-placed keywords, you can just get away without mentioning settings or characters that like people have the archetypes in their heads. You mentioned PI, and you don't need to go pretty much further. People are already imagining the kind of, you know, Humphrey Bogart-esque guy with a cigarette drinking and a tank top. So I was writing these pieces which were like, I don't know, I think 200, 400 words each. I wrote that for 20 weeks. Then I switched to horror. I did 20 more. But I, I decided that you know, I liked the genre, the noir thing. And I thought that I would write a whole novel about it with those ideas, provided I found something a little more original than just, you know, the genre thing, you know, something like a twist to it. Years later, I came up with the idea of A.Z. Kimrian, the character, characters, or the P.I., the guy who is actually a brother and a sister trapped in the same body. And I thought, yeah, that's original enough. That could be my P.I. And that's how I set out to uh, write this body. So basically you needed like two ideas to come together. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Like many times it's about two ideas coming together because one high concept is not big enough. <laughs> For both of us. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> was it difficult balancing just how asshole Adrian would get versus like how over the top Zoe would get um, without trying to... Um... But keep them characters that are worth caring about for the reader. I didn't know they were caring about for the reader. <laughs> but um, I enjoyed writing them a lot, actually, because, again, I have this problem trying to control my own jokes. I very often come up with a joke when I'm writing, and it's like, obviously, I can't put this down here because it doesn't behoove the character at all. It, it doesn't fit them. For Kimrian, actually, like, any joke I could think of fits at least one of them. Like, this is a very mean thing to say. Yeah, okay, but it's Adrian. This is a very stupid thing to say. Yeah, but it's Zoe. So everything fits, everything goes. It was nice to see them pull those different kind of comedy in, in different directions. Maybe it's not different kind of comedy, actually. I don't know. Pretty much the same kind of comedy in a way, but with different characters. I don't know what kind of routine it is, really. The thing is, I didn't give much attention to the actual plot beyond them. If you read This Body is Not Big Enough for both of us closely, you'll notice that it's actually it's not even about the plot. Like, the plot is very secondary. Like, the main theme is these characters and putting them in different situations that are funny. They are funny and sometimes they are complicated because it is a very comic character. They are very comic characters, but I also like the tragic dimension that there is to them. So chimeras do exist, but not to the degree of the Kimrians. So how much research did you do before feeling confident enough following through with the characters? Very little research, because I, I am overconfident. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fiction. I don't think I owe too much to reality, actually. I know I'm here to enhance it, if anything, to improve it. So, um, no, not much. I knew they existed. And I guess I could have gone with some more scientific approach to the chimera thing. But then there was this, for instance, the left brain, right brain thing. It's not really scientifically accurate. It's more like a myth. The thing about our left brain being the rational, logical one and the right brain being creative, passionate. That's actually, yeah, again, it's like an urban legend. So if I was not going to be rigorous about that, why be rigorous about chimeras? <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. So all of the TV detectives and book detectives and movie detectives have one fatal flaw that'll somehow by the end of the story get resolved or maybe somehow ameliorated. But in the case of AZ, I feel like their fatal flaw is probably each other sharing the same body. And that's not really fully resolvable. Do you think this experience that they just had in this book or any future experience will teach them how to work together as a team better? Or are they just forever locked in conflict? Uh, good question. I guess they will learn. I guess, yeah, maybe there's a sort of philosophical trip in the book. They go from, we can stand each other, to, yeah, we can stand each other, but we acknowledge that we can't be left alone either. I guess there's that. On the other hand, there is a line toward the end of this body that I, I think is really funny, where Kimrin says, I can't be locked up again. I've just been out for a week. Then somebody says, yeah, but it's been a very intense week. And they say, no, fuck you, this has been an average week, actually, for me. That's pretty much the thing. I don't think the Kimrians have uh, lived in this book anything so more intense than anything they live throughout their lives. I think that their life are always chaos. I think maybe they've had bigger chances to learn stuff, to have epiphanies, and they just they just kept driving. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I guess they learn, but I'm not sure about how soon they'll forget.
Just as a follow-up to this, so this might be a flaw for them, but in terms of their performance as a detective, it's almost like an advantage because if your flaw is sharing a body with another ace detective, then in terms of your ability to solve the case, that's not that much of a drawback. So in that sense, I guess this is more like a fanboy question, but could Kimreen potentially be the greatest detective of all time? I bet if you ask Kajun, he'll say yes, but... uh the thing about this case in particular, the one in This Body's Not Big Enough, is that it was a sort of a test for the Cimbrians because it challenges, it challenges the idea that Adrian is the best suited one to solve a crime. If you have two detectives in one body, essentially one is BBC Sherlock and the other is, I'm going to say The Mask. <laughs> <laughs> you obviously, your first thought is obviously BBC Sherlock is the most suited to solve a case. But in this case in particular, the plot, it's not kind of like Adrian expects it to be. And it requires someone with more imagination, with a sort of warped view of reality. In a way, like my view of the country, the idea that this is not real life, this is happening on a screen. That's how Zoe thinks all the time, in a way. She thinks that her life, the world, is a work of art and should follow certain rules, which are not followed by real life. To Adrian, their case is real life. And, you know, he's kind of wrong because he's a character in a book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, what I liked about this case is that this case proves some assumptions wrong. It proves that it doesn't take a left brain to solve a, a murder case, actually. It takes imagination. It takes creativity. It takes the same things that it takes to write a book about it. So Kimrian actually shows up in the psych hospital part of yes. Meddling Kids with Nate. Does that book take place before or after? Let, let me put it this way. Like Kimrian appears in Meddling Kids because Kimrian novel was already written when I started writing Meddling Kids. Actually, Kimrian, I wrote in Spanish first, and I thought it was going to be my first book in Spanish, but nobody wanted it there. When I was writing the psychiatric asylum scene in Meddling Kids, I had to come up with several crazy people part of my English, and I thought, hey, I have Kimbrian already. It had been established as canon that he had spent most of their youth in psychiatric hospitals, so why not put him there? But um, chronology-wise, you'll notice it's hard to tell because I'm not strict about those things. My editor thought that maybe I was building a sort of cantero verse here by uh, using the same characters in two different novels, doing crossovers, that kind of thing. The truth is, I am not a planner. So I'm not suited for that at all. And uh, if it were up to me, like most of my novels should exist in their own, like, you know, in a sort of limbo. For instance, this body is not big enough, if you think about it, it's very inconsistent about time setting. We don't ever mention a year. And then there is a, I think, for instance, Ursula mentions a few pop bands. And yeah, that should place it in this dec decade, but what she's saying. But then again, there's a scene at a police station and it says that people are using typewriters and smoking in the office. Mm -hmm. It says 1970s. Right. And um, that's because for this body is not big enough, I wasn't thinking really about a real time or a real place. I was thinking only in aesthetics. I like typewriters and I like people smoking in offices. It's the kind of thing that I enjoy. I'm watching Mine Hunter now and, and I'm watching it essentially only because of that. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, when it's suitable for the plot for the main character to have a cell phone, then I give them a cell phone. So, you know, I, I, it's not like I've said something uh, this year, this place, and these are the rules. No, the rules change as I write, pretty much. So establishing a chronology is difficult to say. But yes, I guess the Kimrians were younger when they met Nate in the psychiatric asylum in Ockham. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we've started talking about meddling kids, so meddling kids, I guess to me, at the heart of the story, it's sort of about the dissolution of friendships and trying to recapture the innocence of childhood and all that. But the theme of growing up is handled differently in meddling kids versus this body's not big enough. So Ursula gets a more upbeat speech, whereas the gang in meddling kids, they're basically told they're entitled little shits. So does this <laughs> reflect your changing views of growing up and like what you would tell younger people? I don't know. And what do you think meddling kids then tell us younger people? Get over yourselves. You're not the most important thing. That sort of thing. We're not exactly super young. We're in our early 30s. But we kind of still think of ourselves as young. And we're in that stage where we mull over our life choices and like think back on things that happened in our 20s and obsess over things sometimes maybe we shouldn't. 
And so that line where the main villain is like, you know, no, you're not actually cursed. You're just... Yeah, you just have the X generation. Yeah, I, I, I got that. a kick out of that. that. That was... I burst out laughing. I couldn't help myself. It was hilarious. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that's not what I would tell to young people. That's what uh, the villain tells young people. And that's why they're the villain. <laughs> right. So that's basically just the difference in the characters that are giving the speech. Where Zoe's trying to um, comfort Ursula a little bit. She's going to say something nice, even if she doesn't really mean it. No, I think she means it. But um, I don't think this body tells anything to young people. If anything, it tells kids that it gets better. That's something I believe because, you know, being a kid was probably the most miserable I was. But in meddling kids, like, I think the concept is very different. Like, meddling kids is about people who were at their happiest when they were kids. And in a way, the novel is not so much about growing up as it is about resistance to growing up. The main character, Andy, uh, has this extremely idealized version view of how their lives were when they were 12. And she was, like, super happy. She had a a gang of friends, which she said she had no friends outside the Blade of Summer Detective Club. She had a love interest, even a budding love interest. And she feels like what happened, the mystery they solved, they didn't solve when they were 12, somehow ruined that. And she's, she wants to take it back. So yeah, for the other characters, I guess, in Meddling Kids, revisiting the Sleep Lake case is about looking back and trying to grow past these things. But I'm not sure Andy, who is the principal motor of the story, wants to actually move forward. I think what she wants is to go back. I think she would be very happy if things were exactly like they were when they were 12. I guess asking a lighter question than that. So we have to ask the Scooby-Doo question, because I'm actually a huge fan of Scooby-Doo. Uh-huh. So, Me too. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, were you a fan of Scooby-Doo growing up, and have you watched the newer shows like Be Cool Scooby-Doo, but especially Mystery Inc.? I've watched at least one season of a newer show, and this was like four or five years ago, and I can't remember the name. Which one was it? Can you help me out here? Is it the one where the monsters were real and there was like a whole crystal cold? The one where there was, I think they discovered that there used to be another crime solving gang. That's Mr. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I saw, uh, I think the first season of that one. And I remember having watched actually the very first iterations, Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? The very first seasons. Yeah, when I was a, a very young kid. And yeah, they had a very big influence on me because... Yeah, because, you know, haunted houses and that kind of thing, you know, a horror that doesn't scare you, actually, but uh, that it's fun. It's the kind of horror book that I've been trying to write all my life, you know, <laughs> the, kind of, the one that doesn't actually make you feel uncomfortable at all. <laughs> That's the formula I like. Yeah, I, I was actually reminded of that. There was a passage in Supernatural Enhancements where the main character, A, is writing a letter back to the end, and he's talking about how some of the hallways just seem to be galleries for the display of curtains. And I just instantly imagined, like, a Scooby-Doo chase scene of people, like, (laughs) jumping out from behind the curtains. I I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, (laughs) that's true. (laughs) Just jumping back to Mystery Inc., I I think you'd like season two, simply because it kind of goes full Lovecraft, and there's, like, gigantic world-encompassing tentacle monsters and stuff so we actually started listening to your book because we had watched mr inc and we're like we need more things like this and then your book came up on our search you googled tentacles as could we do it (laughs) that's fantastic (laughs) exactly so you you might be interested in that oh absolutely Uh i will check it out cool wait there's a lot of lovecraftian elements in meddling kids But you also subvert a lot of what Lovecraft had in his stories. So, for example, more diverse heroes or themes. Yeah, I will say, like, I pitched uh, Meddling Kids as Enid Blyton meets Lovecraft, which is cool because, uh, you know, they're authors that have nothing in common. But actually, one thing they have in common is that they were very racist. (laughs) (laughs) And having a Latina lesbian main character is something that would have uh, shocked them greatly. And that's really nice. (laughs) (laughs) So going back a little bit more to your uh, writing style, Meddling Kids was our first introduction to it. And there's a lot of made up words, which we enjoyed immensely and derive great pleasure from reading them or actually hearing them. But there was actually kind of a response from some readers that was like, what the heck is this? And how can you, how can you invent the word? Specifically, I'm thinking of Tragic Chuckled, where somebody on oh, Twitter... Oh, yeah, Tragic Chuckled. There's, there's people who are really vexed by that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, there's there's a complaint that I use like either very obscure words or completely made up words. But I mean, you have to look at it from my point of view. This is my third language, so uh, there's a lot of words that I don't know. And uh, I actually do judge a book by how uh, many words it teaches me. If I'm reading a novel now and by page 10, it hasn't made me check up the dictionary once. I start to think that that author has nothing to teach me and that's bad. Not always, of course, like there are authors who use a very simple vocabulary and that's part of their style. I appreciate that a lot, but it's, it's not the norm. And on the other hand, I also like English because it is very easy for you guys to make up words. You do it all the time, not only in books, like in journal articles and newspapers. And I, I don't know, you, you seem to be coining terms very easily and they spread easily too. Probably because you don't have an institution, a high institution regulating that from their high palace, <laughs> unlike Catalan and Spanish. I couldn't get away with making up words in Catalan or Spanish at all. I would have like really intense fights with my copy editors. And here, nobody but an eye when I, when I write Tragic Chaco. Okay, some readers do. But uh, yeah, that, but that's too far down the line. You know, the copy editors let it go. So... <laughs> We hope you keep making up more words. I hope. Like, again, it's very fun to do. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're pretty good at it. <laughs> All right. So, Supernatural Enhancements. I'm just, like, fresh off of reading it. Super excited to talk about it. But I guess before we get into that, was there any reason specifically that you chose for it to be an epistolary novel? No. Again, I'm planned. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you how I started writing Supernatural Enhancements. Um, all I wanted to do was a haunted house story. I started writing after I finished, I don't know, maybe a book of short stories by Fernand Lee, I think. I don't know, I can't remember. I started writing and, of course, the first thing was somebody who has just inherited a haunted house. And it seems like they are writing on a journal or something because it, it kind of fit a uh, first-person narrative. After that, there is a letter to Aunt Liza describing the house in some detail. And after that, there is a conversation with Neve, who is mute. So she's using her uh, notepad to write her lines and later he fills it with his responses. And I had finished the first chapter without having to intervene once as a narrator. And I said, oh, that's cool. I wonder how further can I keep doing this? And it turns out it was the whole book. <laughs> but that's the whole thing, that there was never a plan for it. And sometimes... Yeah, sometimes I did feel cornered here because sometimes, you know, like I need to explain what is happening in this room, but I never set a camera in this room and there's no reason for them to set a camera in this room. So how am I going to say it? It's complex to write an epistolary novel for real. Epistolary novels very often cheat. They very often end up with uh, characters writing a letter stuff that they, you would never write in a letter or not with that much detail, that kind of thing. Even Dracula, which is like a very famous epistolary novel, by the end... It admits that the final chapters are essentially like a very long chronicle of uh, typewritten uh, documents explaining the whole denouement of the novel. That's kind of cheating, you know? It's more interesting at the beginning when you have like a captain's log and, and every character's journals and letters and that kind of thing. I didn't want to do the Dracula solution. I want to stay uh, uh, loyal to the epistolary format for real. And sometimes it was really tricky, and, and it leaves a lot of blanks in the middle and everything. But uh, I don't know. It, it's a book that leaves so many unanswered questions, but again, some of them can be blamed on the epistolary nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this probably requires a little further explanation, but you're not going to explain this in a letter. So yeah. I don't explain it, and that's it. Yeah, that's actually one of the big things that stood out for me reading this book is that for everything you learn, you discover about 10 other things that I got to know what this is. It just basically ends up like you end up asking more questions. Yes. And more questions. And, and so the more you learn exponentially, the number of questions in your head builds up until the very end when like maybe like two of them are answered and a million more pop up and then the book ends. Yeah. If you notice, that's very much the theme of the book. The whole book is about a society that are obsessed with one magical object, the one magical thing they have, which is essentially like a window. And this window occasionally shows glimpses of other magical things out there that they can never reach. The supernatural enhancements is just about people who have one glimpse of the supernatural, one very tiny glimpse, and become obsessed with it. Because, yeah, it opens the door to so many possibilities. You know, the only thing they're doing essentially is widening the field, and that's it. Mm -hmm. 
it was the kind of story that I wanted to write. It's not as much horror in a way as it is, you know, existential philosophical abyss. The panic and yet the comfort of knowing that there are things out there left to be explored. Yeah. Just as a quick uh, side, I, I think you mentioned earlier about writing the scary scene. I was genuinely scared by the ghost in the haunted house. That's great. The scary and, ghost. And, and yeah, the ghost, it's not like she's that scary. Right. Because maybe one thing I wanted to challenge with the supernatural enhancements was the idea that the haunted house was necessarily a bad thing. In many ways, several of the Victorian late 19th century novelists who I was reading, writing a horror, did write it for enjoyment because they thought it was it was fun. Many of M.R. James' ghost stories are essentially like anecdotes, which are not even like, they're not even shared like they're supposed to be scary. They're shared like, here's something really interesting that happened to me. I once saw a ghost. Even the title of the, of the Supernatural Enhancements comes from a short story by Edith Wharton, where she refers to a haunted house, essentially, as a house with supernatural enhancements, as if that were something to seek for in a house. I, I kind of share that view, and I wanted my characters to share that view. They moved into a haunted house that they know it's haunted, they confirm it's haunted, and their response is not, oh, I'm scared, but holy shit, this is awesome. <laughs> we have a haunted house. I mean, imagine the implications. Right. One other thing that stood out to me reading the book is that th this is coming like right on the heels, maybe like a month after I read This Body's Not Big Enough. And This Body's Not Big Enough, there's a little fourth wall breaking aside regarding hashtag problematic um, <laughs> with respect to uh, Ursula's character. Yeah. I couldn't help but wonder if that came from some feedback maybe you got from Supernatural Enhancements regarding the relationship in the book. Mm, no. I think I was saying, I mean, that Ursula was problematic in herself. That's essentially why I put her in the book. Mm -hmm. I don't like to put easy romantic plots. I like to have, let's say, unbalanced romantic plots. Ones that are complicated by nature. Like mm -hmm. Andy's gay, Carrie isn't or doesn't know she is. In the case of Kimrian, it was, well, Adrian hates people. Zoe is uh, hypersexual, and she believes, she's probably right, that she can seduce anyone. And we give her love interest someone that she shouldn't seduce at all. And in the supernatural enhancements, I wasn't even thinking that much about that. The thing is that the character of Neve, who is a minor in the book, is a character that I had already created previous to that. I don't know why I decided that for the book to work in 1995, she was supposed to be 16. Again, I can't remember the math. Maybe I, at the time I was thinking that the book was going to be something bigger than it actually was. Mm. And um, to me, Neve was always the star of the show. But yeah, she was 16. She was mute. It was very difficult to have her as the sole main character. So essentially, I put in someone who is an adult and who can speak pretty much just as a mediator between her and the world. And then later he becomes the love interest. But I never gave much thought really about whether their relationship was doomed or not. In fact, very few readers said like, oh, I'm really shocked about this. <laughs> I was not even my editor, who was like very interested in the romantic plot, would have tagged it as problematic, I think. Mm. I don't know. And then I, th I think you like... Named your book tour the problematic tour, right? Is that? Yeah, the, the book tour for uh, This Body's Not Big Enough, I called hashtag problematic tour. Yeah, <laughs> I like that set. I like that line a lot. Yeah, it was, it was funny. Do all your books take place in the same universe? Again, difficult to say because what universe does this body happen in that it allows for typewriters and Taylor Swift at the same time? Well, but uh, yeah, the Canteroverse, right? Yeah, I don't know. I guess the answer is yes, but do not expect me to ever write anything as detailed as the, you know, Marvel Universe well, with all its different uh, parallel dimensions and all that shit at all. Like, I, I don't have the patience for that, and I, I will never do it. But, um, no, yes, I do like the idea of Nate and Kimrian having met at least once, and there could be a lot more like that, because, again, like, most of my novels are left, like, very open-ended. So, yeah, there is a big chance that pretty much everyone knows each other. Maybe they will meet in the future. On the other hand, I'm not having any luck pushing sequels. My editors so far insist me always uh, writing new stuff 
So I don't know if I'll have time to revisit old characters. Yeah, so in a recent Twitter poll, actually, you asked followers to rate five different book pitches. Yeah. And without going into too many specifics, it seemed to me that at least two of the choices could be sequels Yes. to your already published books. I tweeted that poll, though, when my editors had already answered. And I can tell you it was not one of the sequels. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. You should have shown them the... I don't know what the results of the poll were, but you should have been like, look, I assume like the, one of the The sequels. high concept that contained the word porn won. Oh, really? <laughs> and, and I must say it was one of my favorites too, absolutely. But my editor didn't like that one at all. Damn it. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I think I voted for the one that... Which I now think would have been a sequel to... Uh, the Supernatural Enhancements. Yeah. Yes. I didn't realize at the time. I just liked the, how the words flowed together. And then I read Supernatural, and I was like, oh my goodness. That, that's essentially this. Yeah. yeah. I chose Area 51. Yeah. The porn. I, yeah. <laughs> I actually chose it for Area 51. I know, 51. yeah, yeah, I know. Everybody's about Area 51, of course. Of course. Much more yeah. quick. <laughs> are we allowed to ask about the musical? And that's the same one. Oh. The porn, Area 51, and musical. Oh, man. <laughs> it was the same one. Yeah, again, maybe someday. I don't know. Basically, the, the musical is when you gave the book talk at Books Are Magic, somebody got you to say that you have this concept where you want to have a book that's also a musical, literally has songs right there in the text. Yeah, the characters simply burst into song at very specific moments. Yes, I think I have like a prologue and two episodes of that. And it's the same project that was born Treasure Map Area 51. Mm. That was it. But again, neither my editor nor my agent liked it. <laughs> In fact, they, I think they disliked the porn part so much that they didn't even comment on the musical part. And I was like, really? But there are songs. You're, you're not going to say anything about the songs. Like, they're fantastic. Oh, man. <laughs> have you thought of making it an audio drama? They have, too. My editor has suggested it. But, I mean, come on. If you make an audio drama out of this, essentially, you're just, you're just writing a musical. Which is, like, really cool. Again, I mean, I have nothing against musicals. In fact, I've learned to respect it a lot. One of my best friends back in Barcelona is a playwright, and he's actually written several musicals. When I was writing this porn treasure map, Area 51, high concept, I started writing songs. I went to him and said, writing songs is, like, the funniest thing in the world. And he said, yeah, that, that's exactly why I do it, because it's, it's, it's like, really fun to uh, force yourself to rhyme and stuff while you're telling a story. So yeah, I respect it a lot, but that's not original. A printed book that is a musical, that is original. <laughs> and that forces you to, you know, to, to sing in your head. I think that that's the funny part. If you just do a musical, that's been done before. I think it's a great idea. I'm pretty sure the response at the Books or Magic talk was very positive. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Someday. <laughs> Whatever. Um, I think we have one last question. At Book Expo, there was a lot of talk within the industry about pushing for diversity. Most of the pushing for diversity. Oh, okay. In in writing and getting diversity in in the publishing industry and diverse authors and also diverse characters in books. And that was like basically like the buzz at this year's Book Expo. And as an author, do you feel? more responsibility towards doing some background research when writing characters that don't share a similar background as yourself? Here's the thing, like, I should say yes, because I do believe I should say yes, but I know myself, I know I don't research much more complicated things than that. I do think that diversity in books is extremely necessary, and in publishing too. That said, I am a very white, pretty straight male, and I don't think it is my owners, for instance, to write the perfect gay relationship in a novel. I think that's, if anyone, that's the owners of a female gay novelist. I write it essentially because, because I like it, because it's more interesting than simply a straightforward white boy, white girl relationship. I do try for diversity, but I do not try to get it perfect at all. Like, I, I know I will never do. I think... My work with uh, diverse characters is essentially trying to treat them as I treat my stock characters, my unimaginative characters, which are usually the white male ones. And it's, uh, uh, you know, treat them fairly. I am aware of stuff like, you know, the bury your gaze trope, that kind of thing. I, I'm sorry, the, the what the trope? Bur the bury your gaze trope, which means that gay characters always die. Oh. 
usually because I understand that what happens there is essentially because in many TV shows, they're putting gay characters, but they don't, they don't put it on the front line exactly. They put it for sort of, you know, secondary characters, your Tara and your Willow, you know. And then when you need to kill somebody, obviously you're not going to kill the lead, you're going to kill the one who's on the second row, so the second row is the gay, and the gay dies. I do want to try to avoid that because I do understand it's tiring. And writing diverse characters has been very rewarding, actually. Like, I've had fan mail and, you know, emails and stuff talking about representation and how grateful they are for a character I wrote or something that really are, like, the best part of this. So I, I do try to do it really well, but again, I know I will never get it perfectly. It's not my duty to do it. And I'm so bored about research, really. Like, <laughs> please don't make me do homework because I hate it. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of felt you were going to say that based on how you were answering some of our previous questions. Yeah, like, you know, again, if if I don't plan a novel, like if, if I don't research, Supernatural Enhancements was set in Virginia, Meddling Kids was set in Oregon. I've never been to either of those places ever in my life. So I am not going to do a lot of research when I create the Native American sheriff in Meddling Kids. I do some research to make sure that I get some facts right, like that the Walla Walla exists and they are in that geographical area and that, etc., that they have their own language and, and even that some words even remind of those etymologies, that kind of thing. But um, no, I never consult. I'm never too worried about that. Also, I must say, since I mentioned this, like there's a push for, how you call this, for sensitivity readers in publishing houses. I don't think my material goes through a sensitive to reader specifically, but I can tell you that, of course, everyone else who I work with is American, and it helps a lot because my sensitivity, my, for instance, my racial sensitivity as a European is extremely different from the American one. They fix a lot of stuff for me there. Okay. So, at the end of the interview, we like to ask the author just a few standard questions that we ask everybody. First, we have four book-related questions. We'll ask them kind of all at once. We'll throw in a random question as a fifth one when you're done with those first four. So, yeah, Anna? And you want right. short answers, sir? Any long, Most short people answer. forget the four questions by the time we get to the fourth one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no overlap allowed, so you can't have the same answer for two different questions. Okay, so if your favorite is already something else, you have to choose your second favorite. Okay. So the favorite book from your childhood, favorite book you've read recently, favorite book of all time, and what are you reading currently? I really can't think of a favorite childhood book. Like, I can't even think of a childhood book because I read so many comics that I don't think I allotted a lot of time to uh, to actual writing. Favorite childhood book, if I am going to be honest, should be a comic book. and uh, should be something made in Spain, so you probably won't know it at all, so who cares? <laughs> <laughs> favorite thing I have read lately, I am sent many books you know, for blurbing purposes. And one that has struck me as magnificent is Oyinkan Braithwaite's My Sister the Serial Killer, which I think is coming out this month. Favorite book of all time? Again, difficult and there's many, but uh, I can tell you the one book that I reread really, really often is Ficciones by Jorge Luis Borges, collection of short stories. The book I am reading right now, I am between books. I've just finished a William Faulkner, boring. And uh, next one in the pile, I think, is an Agatha Christie. So that's not for blurbing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Which Agatha Christie? Appointment with Death, I think. Which Faulkner book? It was a short story called Bear. I read this short story, but it turns out it's like actually a chapter from a longer book, and I can't remember the title. But I sure won't read the novel because I had trouble getting through the short story itself. So. <laughs> and the random question that doesn't have to do with books is... A studio, any studio, is offering you the head writing job to reboot any show of your choice. Reboot or bring back, what show is it? Unlimited resources. Does it have to be a show or any franchise? Like a film franchise? Yeah, I guess if you want to do a film franchise. It's not necessarily a reboot, but uh, here's the thing I would absolutely love to write. Looney Tunes. Okay. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't see that coming. I guess maybe we should have seen that coming. <laughs> With the Roadrunner uh, references. Uh, the kind of, you know, that yeah, that seven-minute format of, of cartoons, that's that's absolutely something I would pay for, for writing. <laughs> nice. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate the My time. pleasure. Before we go, how can our listeners get themselves a copy of one of your books, and where can they find you online? 
for a copy of any of my books, I want to think that any bookstore should do the trick, really. Well, except for the Catalan ones, of course, but whatever. And to find me online, well, I have a blog, which is pankahoy.blogspot.com, and you'll find my Twitter handle and my Tumblr handler there. And that's pretty much all the social network I'm available on. Okay. Well, thanks again. We really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Red Read Podcast. Join us again as we continue our journey down Fear Street. We love hearing from you guys, so feel free to reach out to us at Red Read Podcast on Twitter and Facebook. Email us at red.read.podcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Once again, thanks for listening. See you again soon.